Now, the prize lectures are the undoubted jewels in the EASD crown. One of the most important is the Camillo Golgi lecture, now in its 37th year. And I'm delighted to say that we have with us uh, Professor Michael Horowitz, who is giving this year's Camillo Golgi lecture. So, first of all, congratulations. Thank you, Phoebe. And I've never been regarded as a jewel in the crown before. This is the first time. Well, consider yourself buffed and shiny. You are officially a jewel in the crown. Now, your particular field is gastric emptying. Now, tell me why this became the subject that you have pursued for the best part of 40 years. Well, again, when you give this sort of lecture, you think about your past. And as we alluded to, I was programmed to be interested in science. So my parents were both refugees from Europe in the war. In fact, my mother was studying science in Prague and was lucky to escape Czechoslovakia to come to Sydney. And she was, I have a photo which I'll show in my lecture, is the only woman in her class surrounded by males studying science. And she came to Sydney, to Sydney University, and that time she could only speak, well not only speak, she spoke Czech, German, French and no English and she was allowed to have her exams in French. So she thought Australia was the best place in the world. And she met my father who had a degree in agricultural sciences from the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Sydney University. And they moved to the Waite Institute in Adelaide when he had a position as head of plant genetics where I was born. So I think that was my background where a love of science and scientific rigour and also classical music and also good food, but they're not the subject of today's conversation. <laughs> so why gastroenterology and diabetes, that crossover there? Well, as you alluded to, I've spent about 40 years studying the stomach and diabetes and many of my colleagues consider that an ill-considered career choice, but uh, it's, brought, it's brought me here. So, I'm pleased. But fundamentally, it's a crossover area and I would like to say that I was clever and decided but that would be untrue it was serendipity so my two PhD supervisors one was an eminent gastroenterologist and the other was an endocrinologist so this is a crossover area and it was obvious that it had great potential in research and that has been fulfilled so it was by chance rather than good sense. And um, what did you find, or what were you considering at the first? What was your hypothesis? Well, we didn't know. There are really two aspects to this. Firstly, it was suggested we, any clinician managing patients with diabetes, type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes, has people with so-called intractable gastroparesis. It's a terrible disease and still is a terrible disease where the stomach empties much more slowly. And it was also known in some people that was not associated with symptoms but could affect blood glucose control and with a predisposition to hypoglycemia in people who are on insulin. But the, what happened at my time is measurement techniques, particularly the ability to measure the rate stomach empties using radioisotopically labelled meals and a gamma camera, so-called scintigraphy. And that showed that instead of being a rare condition, it occurred in about 40% or of people with long-standing complicated type 1 or type 2 diabetes. So there's been research as relation to the prevalence of disordered gastric emptying, which is a common complication of diabetes. The other area is the recognition of the rate of the stomach empties is a very important determinant of the magnitude of the rise in blood glucose after a meal. And why it is a particularly important determinant that varies between individuals is in healthy individuals, there's about a four times variation in the rate of stomach emptying. I don't know why. And then we have this very high prevalence of patients with disordered delayed gastric emptying and then more recently it's been recognized in certain racial groups predisposed to diabetes and in early type 2 diabetes not type 1 diabetes stomach emptying tends to be accelerated leading to a rise in blood glucose after meals that's greater so I couldn't have predicted all of that but that's the summary of the journey for me <laughs> And it's obviously brought you a great deal of pleasure along the way. What 
was the moment in your career that you, you really felt stood out for you? I, I think it's nice to be part of a change in paradigms which has influenced clinical management. But just uh, coming here today to meet long-standing friends, it's, it's a privileged existence to do clinical research and interact with other people. So I, I had dinner last night with my good friend Michael Nauk, is the recipient of the Claude Bernard Reward, and he has been to our house many times and we play the piano together very badly. Well, he plays well, I play badly. <laughs> Where do you think this area of research is going next? I think in two areas, it's a good question. Well, your questions are all good, Vivian. The first is relation to the high prevalence of delayed gastric emptying in diabetes, in long-standing diabetes. Whether it's 30%, 40%, 50%, it's common. It was assumed that that was the direct cause of symptoms. That clearly is incorrect. The relationship of symptoms with the rate of gastric emptying is relatively weak. So the long-standing approach of trying to make the stomach pump better to improve symptoms is marginal at best. So we need new approaches to the treatment of symptomatic gastroparesis. That's one side. The other side is the relevance of gastric emptying to blood glucose control. And it's very important and it needs to be measured more. And now it can be measured by techniques which are safe and simple. So I believe that this needs to be looked at of novel therapies that target postprandial glucose. And of course, in individuals type one or type two who have reasonable glycemic control, if we define that as a glycated hemoglobin of less than eight, the rise in the blood glucose after the meal, not the fasting blood glucose, is the major determinant of that glycated hemoglobin. So it's a fascinating area still. It's still, there are so many doors still left to open, aren't there? Yes, it's because we've been virtually everything I thought was incorrect. <laughs> it's a good way of summarising many people's scientific careers that have nevertheless led to major discoveries. <laughs> yes, since I've got the prize, I'm willing to acknowledge that. <laughs> So you're here at EASD 2022 after a long absence for everyone. What particularly are you looking forward to in this year's programme? Well, it's a momentous occasion for me because I'm here with my family. All four children are here. The only one left at home is the dog, and I'm very pleased the dog's been left at home. And I look forward to looking at the sites, but I look forward probably as much as having my family being here, interacting with my friends. And I caught up with Michael Nauk and his wife for dinner last night, and that was lovely. So that is the privilege of doing research, is the long-standing friendships to establish. And actually, that's one of the great joys of EASD, isn't it? That this particular meeting and bringing everybody together and how much we've missed it in lockdown. I, for me, uh, the scientific quality of this meeting is extraordinarily high. But for me, the most important aspect is to interact both socially and scientifically. And I think the two are related. People tend to forget. Uh, science moves forward much more effectively with close friendships linked to them uh, and uh, that is a great joy for me and it's been a privilege to be part of it. I couldn't uh, uh, have you've, you've said exactly what I think so many people think and feel is the value of human interaction and its importance so yes. congratulations uh, our Go Camillo Golgi prize lecturer thank Michael you. Horowitz. Pleasure to talk to you thank, thank you very you. much. And we'll have more very soon. Bye for now.